Hello, everyone. Welcome to Asteroid Citratus, Journey to Alaxia. Everybody go ahead and introduce yourselves. I'm D&D Unoptimized. I play Russo Tricolin. I am Dornish Princess, and I play as Myra Kailani. My name is Egg, and I play second. Hello, I'm the Unscore Twig, and I'm playing Evergrey. And I am your DM today. Where we last left off, we were down at Myra Kalani's house. It's a, you know, it's a nice house with a garden outside. It's mud brick. And knocking at the door was Russo. Um, at Russo, as you're walking up, you see her father kind of go, Oh, what you doing here, kid? Uh, hello there. I'm looking for the Kalani residence. Well, it's, um, this is it. Um, at this point, you've already knocked on the door, so at any point, Myra, you can open the door at whichever point you think is right in the conversation. Well, um, yeah, is there something you need? We already have a guest right now, so might be a moment. I don't know if anybody's um, would hear the knock on the door. Ah, uh, well, uh, I definitely don't mean to intrude. Um, I'm just looking for... Uh... M M Misa Kalani. I, I believe she's an acquaintance of my, my parents. Um, oh, who are your parents? Um, hmm. Kaylin and I guess I'll Shira go get the Chikana. door. No one else is going to answer it. Are you, uh, Mr. Kalani? Well, and the door swings open. So you see standing behind you is Myra. Oh, well, there's Myra here. Oh, uh, hi, um, who are you? I'm Russo Tricolin, uh, the son of Kalen and Shira Tricolin. I'm here to oh. re request the aid of, of Misa Kalani. Oh, uh, yeah, come in, come in. Mom's just, she has um, another guest, but uh, you're welcome to come in. I just tidied up a bit. Certainly. As you're walking in, you see that the place looks really nice even though it was very unclean moments before you showing up. It's probably a little bit hiding off in a corner because of quickly cleaning things up. The father just stays outside and continues working on the garden. I'll nod my head to him and, and enter. Um, as you enter, there's a, a nice dining room table and a kitchen. And, you know, it's not a large house. There's some rooms and there's a place to sit down and eat. Here, um, come have a seat. Uh, Russo, was it? I'll, I'll grab my mom. She's just in the other room. Thank you, Myra. So you walk over to the door to your mother's room, which is where she's talking to Miss Malchus right now. How do you open the door? Um, I hesitantly knock firmly, but not aggressively. About 10 seconds pass, and then the door opens a crack. Do you need anything? In the middle of a conversation here. Yeah, I know, Mom. There's um, there's a young man here to see you. Does he have somewhere else to be? He he mentioned um, his mom. It sounds like some of your old buddies you told me about. Um, he's here to see you. I don't know what's going on. Well, you can handle it just as well as I could. If he has a job for you, take it. And she closes the door. And as she's walking, uh, as she's closing the door, you hear Malchus kind of start back up in the conversation again. Oh, well, with Project Afterlife, and then the door closes. And you don't hear any more of the conversation. That's ominous. Can I put my ear against the door? Um, yeah, give me a perception check. 21. On a 21, you begin to hear uh, Malchus start talking. Well, you know, we're trying to lift the curse on the land and uh, people debating whether it's even there in the first place. And farmers are always finding more salt as they sow the crops and plowing it out of the earth. And we're trying to collect it and bring it to the fossil sanctuary and so we can destroy all of it at once. But I mean... Uh, it's not happening fast enough. We need to work faster. We need a better solution. And maybe we can kill two birds with one stone. The Reapers have 
they believe if we can bind it to the fossil sanctuary, then it should solve both our problems. Well, I don't see how this involves me. Look, I'm retired. If you need somebody, get Myra. Otherwise, get out. Door is about to open up. Do you do anything? Yeah, I'm going to dash back to the dining room. Uh, give me a stealth check. Not athletics? Has to be stealth? Um, I mean, are you prioritizing making it to the table or making sure they don't hear you run? Okay, stealth. <laughs> oh no, it's a seven. You rush over to the table, but your focus is on speed because that's what you're trained in and not as much on stealth in that moment. So uh, there's not an immediate recognition of this. Malchus walks through the door and Russo, you see a woman with white hair, a red cap, a long brown trench coat, black and red blouse that's vertically striped and black pants person that you once saw a long while ago. Russo, what is your reaction to this? Um, I will immediately turn my face uh, to hide it. Give me... I'm going to say either deception or stealth. I'll give you the option. Uh, deception, I suppose. That's an eight. It begins okay. again. Oh, starting off strong. So on an eight... <laughs> They don't see your face. You do turn it successfully, but they go and sit down at the table with you. Oh, what's, um, how are you guys doing? You see that Misa has kind of posted up against the wall, kind of leaning against it, just staring at her, not saying anything. We, we just met, actually. Russo came here to uh, meet with my mother. Russo, what a nice name. You know, I'm here to meet with, um, for mother too. Very well known. Yes, yes, she's she's very, very talented. Yeah. Are you? I'm hesitating and I glance over at my mother, looking for her approval. That's all I need to know. Um, I'm going to need you to make a wisdom saving throw, uh, Russo. Not my strong point. <laughs> one. <laughs> <laughs> On a one you find yourself too afraid to move and she kind of steps around walks to the other side of the table and looks down at your face hmm do i know you uh, no I, I don't believe we've met uh, before what's your name oh just um governor malchus he's not from around here hmm. she's going to stare down at your hand could you remove the gauntlet please um, madam, I, I, don't, um, I don't believe we've uh, acquainted ourselves that far that we should be removing our articles of clothing. I'm not giving you an option. And this time she's going to cast command on you. Just give me a quick perception for, check for me, Myra. 16. You see that quickly a bit of Neuralite moves out of her hand and floats to the back of his neck and taps on his neck and then comes back to her hand. And you would know that that sort of technology is extremely frowned upon. Unlike the other parts of Citratus, there is a general distrust of technology of all kinds. You're not entirely sure what okay. this technology is, but there's a good chance she's not that if people knew she had it, it would affect her standing. So what was your role in the saving throw? Mine on the perception was a 16. I rolled a five on the wisdom save, if that's what you're. Oh, the wisdom for. save, yeah. On a five. Wait, wasn't the wisdom save the one? It was. Uh, I rolled a, I rolled a one for the wisdom save to be frightened, and then if the command spell is a, I have to leave a wisdom oh. save. That's a five. Yeah. I like to roll d sixes instead of d twenties. I think it keeps it interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So she just casted the command spell on you, and she's gonna say remove. Um, I'll take my pants this, off. This is this is my house. What <laughs> do you think you're doing in my home? Uh, do you actually take your pants off? 
<laughs> well, that's what I was insinuating she was uh, getting at, so that's what I'm going to do. I guess that technically satisfies the requirements of the command spell, technically. <laughs> um... <laughs> I don't know what you're looking for here, but um, please. What is happening right now? Everybody get out of my house. Give me a performance check with advantage from help from Myra. 18. A decent roll. What is this? Oh, thanks for the advantage. I'm not trying to do anything. You know what? I'm sorry. I apologize. Goodbye. I will talk to you another time. She looks over at Misa, who stares daggers at her, and she immediately looks frightened for the first time in this conversation and walks out. Misa walks over, locks the door. I'm so sorry. I, um, is, I've never what been- What was that? I, I, something manipulates my, my mind. I, <clears throat> sorry, that, I'm gonna pull my pants back up. Oh, you got her to be on the defensive. Mom, do you have smoke in your eyes? Like, what? Why did you not step in? She's the governor. I don't want. You don't want to piss off people with power. We have a nice life here. I've. Well, maybe the wrong people are in power. Give me a persuasion check. Eleven. Excuse me. Her mother was was governor before her, and before her, and before her. It is an apprenticeship. She is trained for this. It is not a matter of who is fit to be there. It is a matter of who has the knowledge, who has been trained. Her profession is statecraft. If she wasn't a governor, what would she do? You can't simply remove Apparently somebody. trained strippers. Uh, that I, is... I, I thoroughly apologize for that. <laughs> Don't worry. I assume it was a tactic on your part to get her out. I hope you'll allow me to reintroduce myself. I'm Richard Chakalan, son of Caitlin and Shira. They spoke very highly of you. And uh, I'm here. I'm here to request your aid in, in dire circumstances. I'm not in a position to be doing that. I've got to be here to take care of your father. And But... If we want somebody equally as skilled and can do all the same things I can do. Are you sure? His parents were people that I worked with before. Apple probably doesn't fall very far from the tree. It never does. She kind of nods at you. Got the money to pay? I have a small prepayment that I can offer at this time. Unfortunately, circumstances have removed me from... The uh, source of wealth that I, I wish I could present to you at this time. See, Kayla and Shear have been attacked. I ended up fleeing the Steel Citadel with not but the clothes on my back. But I know for certainty, as soon as we set things right, we'll be able to pay you. Just like they always have. Well, if they had recognized their role and understood they needed somebody there to protect them, Maybe they would have gotten out, too. Look, we don't work for free. I'm not asking. I have some good quality chips here I can offer. But uh, I just want you to understand this is a prepayment. And I'll hand her all 14 gold I have. Don't hand it to me. She's the one taking the job. I'll place it on the table. What do you think? I I guess I'm doing this. <sighs> All right. Start packing. Go. I run up the stairs to my room. Start packing. The second Myra leaves, she sits down at the table. Look, her job is to protect you. That said, not this time. You protect yourself. She needs to learn. She needs to practice so that next time she's protecting somebody, it can actually be her responsibility. If you get her killed... I will hunt you down and kill you myself. Understood? Um, trying to understand this now. So, um, how much are you paying me to protect your daughter? <laughs> Give me an intimidation check. It ain't to be intimidating, but I guess it is. <laughs> and <laughs> I like you. She walks away and starts heading up the stairs. Um, what are you doing in your room to prepare? I have 
hidden some of my dad's supplies in the bottom of my bag. And I am packing all of my gear and clothing that I know I need to bring with me from what my mother's taught me before. The second you finish prepping the bag, she walks in, doesn't knock on the door. Actually pauses after she knocks on, she doesn't knock on the door. Sorry, I, I should have. It's fine, I'm ready. I'm done. I can go. Yeah. You know, um, the kid kind of reminds me of your brother. Just, you um, haven't talked about him in a long time. Yeah, well, I'm just saying don't let it confuse you. You're protecting him, but, you know, protecting him doesn't save your brother. Whatever. Um, right. Um, I'm just going to give this to you. She takes off the necklace that you've always seen her wear, and it's an onyx key that bears the symbol of Admus. She hands it to you and goes, Look, this is the patron deity of privilege. It resides over our house, over our face. And you should have it. Are you sure, Mom? Look, I don't need it anymore. I'm not working. This will give you opportunities. It'll make sure that you can get to the places you need to be. Thank you. I'm honestly shocked. This means a lot. Yeah. You see that she's being a lot gentler than you're used to. For a moment, like her face kind of gets sterner. Unpack it. I want to see you pack it again. Are you kidding me? I just packed everything. Well, you got to do it again. It takes practice. You want to do it right. He's downstairs waiting. I don't want to. And he can wait longer. Look, he's not the one in control here. This will teach him that he has to listen to you. People need to listen to you or they get themselves killed. Everybody you're protecting is a liability. Fine, whatever gets this over with faster. I unpack everything except for my dad's supplies that are buried at the bottom. Um, give me a sleight of hand check to see if she sees him. Oh, it's an eight. I will give you the option of succeeding on this roll if you take a stress. Which a stress is just the opposite of inspiration. Basically, at any point, I can, I, the DM can choose to spend your stress to make you re-roll a check you would have succeeded, and you might fail it. I'll take the stress. I want my supplies. <laughs> <laughs> it all starts here. <laughs> That's my life, full of anxiety. <laughs> oh, God, you're being too mean. You're being too mean. <laughs> what? No. Hey, I made sure she didn't lose some, like, cool items important items so you begin unpacking it and there's a flap in your bag and you're able to kind of like at one point it doesn't look like it's going to cover it but you're able to tear the bag a little bit so that the flap fully covers it and she doesn't see the materials at the bottom okay looks like you got everything here pack it again i want to watch i put all my heavy things towards the bottom and start packing my clothes and lighter weight stuff on top you go through it she tells you to unpack it again, and then you do it again. She tells you to unpack it again, and then you do it again. She tells you to unpack it again, and again, and again, and again. And we're going to fade out of the scene before seeing its conclusion. Thank you all for telling me how your journeys began. I think it's about time that I told you my own beginning. A massive brown tree grows upside down from the cavern ceiling above, creating a canopy that reaches over the entire citadel. Its leaves are cyan and pink stained glass. Lanterns filled with glowing cyan citrulumen hang from its branches. The light from these lanterns pass through the stained glass leaves, basking the entire citadel in a colored light. Looking down at the city below, we see brown wooden buildings. The roofs are either dark blue tiling or brown wood. The windows are made from layered stained glass leaves. Below them hang banners that use a combination of normal and glowing threads. The roads are paved with grey stones that have been overtaken by pink poppies and green grass. Trees and moss crowd the buildings while wicker hearts sleep standing up outside like wooden statues. A finch on the side of the road flies upwards into the branches of the massive upside down tree above. The wind from its wing flaps knocks free a seed with pink leaves. 
It looks to be drifting down to the city below, but a dandelion seed, carried by the wind, bumps into it and knocks it off course. Eventually, it lands in the middle of the stained forest. The trees have yellow, pink, and cyan stained leaves. The bark is brown with colored splotches matching the colors of the leaves. The seed lands in the light green grass below. As time passes, it begins to grow into a wicker heart. Then we fade to nothing. Twig. Your mind is filled with mounds of records of how things are in the moment. It's a copious amount of information. It's all there at once, and it's all you know. Everything else is nothingness. It's just memories. There are lists of citizens' names, blueprints for inventions, sheet music, zoning records, languages. But it's incomplete. There's so much information, and then it just cuts off out of nowhere. You feel like you're supposed to be somewhere. You feel like all this information implies a world exists. You know the world exists, but you're not there. It's just nothingness and these memories. You don't even have a purpose. You don't have a motivation a, or a name. What do you do as you're looking for these records? What do you look for? What do you focus on? I searched through my mind, and I came across many things. Records of art. Records of creatures. Records of the terrain. I know a lot about the terrain. I know where things are. I know what things look like. But I do not know everything. I want to know more. I want to see the world. There's this feeling like on a whim, on a stray thought, you could modify one of these records, you could change it, you could see more of the world by making something up. But there's also the knowledge that it would compromise the integrity of what these records are, a memory of the outside world. If they were to change, they would become useless. They would become worthless. Any records that are changed are, aren't really records anymore. No. The only thing to be recorded is what is real. What is forever. Years pass as you regress further and further into apathy. Without modifying anything around you, without changing it, you can't develop your motives, you can't find a purpose, you can't escape apathy. But eventually, something touches your mind. A new record gets added. A record for you. Most of it is empty but a few fields of it are filled. One is a name, Evergrey, and the second is a purpose, to record beginnings and endings. What? And as you say what, you suddenly gain sight and senses, and I hit my microphone. <laughs> <laughs> and you are suddenly out of this apathy and immediately sense the world around you. You see the trees with stained colors onto them with stained leaves and the grass beneath you. The place that was described as your seed landing is where you are now. Please, Evergrey, describe your character. I am a wicker heart. A wooden man. I am made of the trees. My leaves are stained pink. My bark is that of a cherry tree. It is dark, almost purple in nature, but still definitely bark. I move slowly, creaking slightly, but as I get up to pace, I realize that I can walk with great strides. Actually, you try to move, 
and your roots are stuck in the ground and you can't. Apparently, I am stuck. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? I tug on the roots. I want to see the world, but I'm not sure what my purpose that I have just been given means. I need to ask somebody about it. As you say I need to ask somebody about it, you see light that's passing through the stained leaves flicker, and you're looking down at your feet that are rooted into the ground. As you're trying to remove them, you notice you have a shadow, which is interesting. You didn't see anything about that in your records. But then there's three other shadows. One is dark, like a shadow, and the others are made of pink and cyan stained light that are flickering, and you can see that it has the shapes of the leaves above, but it's forming a silhouette that matches yours. What are these? Can I turn around to look? You can turn your head and your body, but your feet are rooted into the ground. So you can see them, but you can't posture yourself to be directly towards them. So you're looking at one of them. It begins to not match your movements, and then goes, I can't leave until it's perfect. I can't leave until it's perfect. Help me make it perfect. Did you just get Peter Pan? <laughs> It seems to want me to make something. Hmm. I'm going to anger my leaves slightly and try and create the same image that I see, but following my own movements. Okay. Hmm. Give me... I'm gonna say a persuasion check. Oh god, okay. <laughs> Either persuasion or performance. Uh, both are the same. <laughs> Thirty. So as you go to do this, you see it raises up its hand, and it looks like there's the silhouette of maybe music box or something. You're not sure. But as you create your own light to mimic your motions, you see that the light that's connecting to that, like a projector from your leaves, then projects forward into the stained silhouette on the ground, and it begins to convulse its hand back down, and that silhouette of what looked like a music box falls on the ground and breaks. I should leave. It doesn't need to be perfect. And it darts off. There are now two stained silhouettes remaining. Another one leans up to you. What if they forget about me? I don't want them to forget about me. You are. You will always be remembered as what you are. Give me... Hmm. Give me a history check. Okay, I'm much better at that, I hope. Another 13. Even if... Even if they don't think about me, I'll still be remembered as what I was to them. They don't need to know what I've become. And it disappears. There's one silhouette left. I hope they forgive themselves. Please forgive yourself. I wish I could be there. Where is there? I can take you. I know these things. Give me an insight check. That one's a two. You see the silhouette looks as though it's laughing, but you can't hear the laughter. I guess you can't be of much help to me. That's okay. That's how I am now. And it flies away. There are no silhouettes remaining. What does it mean I can't be of much help? I know a lot about where things are. I know a lot about 
the world. I need to find somebody to understand why I have been given this purpose of beginnings and endings. But you're perfect. What does that mean? Why was I given something so strange? You don't need to ask anyone else. And you see your, your shadow begins leaning out of turn with your posture. Just listen to your name. Listen to your purpose. Don't you think it's fitting? I love that name. I like it too. Things are forever. They should not change. Give me a persuasion check. Fourteen. There is a gap in the shadow where light pierces it on the face. You see a smile appear. And then it, the smile disappears. And your roots retract from the ground. You're free. I search my memory. How do I get to the wooden citadel from here? Hmm. Give me a nature check. Sure. That's going to be geography. Either that or survival. You're going for memory, so. That's a sex. Um, That's a sex. You go the wrong way for a while. Eventually, you do make your way to the citadel, but you run into a few random homes before you make it there. It's probably a good week before you show up because, you know, this is your first time walking. It takes a while to figure it out. And we cut over to the Citadel. We're going to go through, I guess not a week of you doing your job, but sort of we're going to go through a series of days where you are kind of doing your tasks and doing the things that related to your purpose. The first task up is over at the Leafy Paws Kennels. So there is a wooden kennel near the Fayleaf Racetrack for Feyre. And currently there are some new Feyre being born. So you're heading over there to kind of record that beginning, to record that birth. You see the wood, the building is made out of wood. It's not super fancy, it's just a kennel. You walk in, you see that there are a couple people in the kennel who just have like, it's after the birth happened. There's some pups there of Feyre. These small ones that have just been born. Why is everyone so excited about them? Well, for one, they're cute, but it's not really the point. You see, there's a gentleman that's kind of portly with a large mustache that comes down to the sides of his face and comes up as a sideburn. You know, but uh, they are used in the races, and people can make a lot of money betting on the races. This is, you know, these are... Um, prized racers, so they figure, you know, if you breed them together, then the resulting kin should have some of the same attributes. But also they're adorable, and he kind of pets the head of one of them. You see, one of the Feyre is called Nightmare, and they have black fur entirely, and maroon antlers, and only blue, only dark blue stained glass in the antlers. Then you see Fleetfoot, which is a white Feyre with fully black antlers and bits of red stained glass and yellow stained glass in the antlers. And you see that there are currently about three pups. Two of them have like black fur and one has white fur, and they both have, you know, various combinations of the antlers colors. But you know, it's, um, it, it's good to pay. I admit that these small ones are, I guess you would say, cute. But if you want to make money out of them racing, then surely the large ones are faster. They will become large. Over time, they will increase in size as I feed them, and, you know, they put I put stuff in their body, and then it gets bigger. Right? I see. Um... And you see, as he's talking, he get, both you and him get interrupted as you see the mother of Feyre kind of struggles a bit. He's like, oh, okay, um, looks like there's one more. 
I'm not going to describe birth. I'm not going to describe an animal giving birth. Um, so that... Um, there will be a record of it. PTSD. <laughs> okay. You. Thanks for giving that. You fully record a record of it. Okay. A few minutes pass by, and you see the Feyre pup that comes out is a combination of white and black. They have different patches of black fur and white fur, and they have one maroon antler and one black. Oh, this is a, oh, this is a nice one. It's cute and, oh no. And you see, after a few seconds pass, you start to see a glow coming from it. A cyan blue glow as the bones in the animal begin to glow and that glow pierces its skin. So you essentially see a skeletal visage overlaid over its body. Oh no, uh... No, 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 I... I was worried about this, but... You know, I thought I saw a little bit of the glow earlier, but I thought it was okay when they all came out fine. Okay, well, I will, um... You don't need to... You can strike this from the record, right? What is happening? Don't worry about it. Explain. Persuasion check. Make me do a lot of charisma. I mean, this is... <laughs> yeah, this is a social thing. One. It is none of your concern. Look, it is there. It, you remember how you said that it is important that I make money off of them? Well, if there is a record of this one, I will not make money off of them, and I will stop. I will have to retire these two. Um... So it is better if we strike it for monetary reasons. Sometimes we must obfuscate information for the good of those involved. Um, I want to make a projection of it so that I can record it anyway. Okay. You create a projection of it there. Um, I'm going to just do an insight check to see if he even understands why you're doing that. So go ahead and give me deception really quickly. Actually, you can just give me what would be like your passive deception if you want to give me that. Uh, nine. Hey, no, this is, you don't have to, uh, uh, okay, fine. I, I guess it's, um, he walks over into the other room and is going to put it away. Look, I will find another owner for it. Um, you know, just if there's a record of it, just, you know, don't walk around telling people about it it's you know maybe people want to know this looks down at the projection again freaking the the oh. archivist needs to know these things yes yes the archivist needs to know oh, another wicker heart walks into the building doesn't say anything looks at the pups quickly gives a nod of recognition and walks out uh, question, do you remove the projection when that happens or no? Uh, probably once it has been recorded, I can remove it. Give me... Hmm. I'm trying to record something. I'll say investigation. Give me an investigation check to see how quickly you make a record of it. Six. The Wicker Heart walks in, looks at the thing you're making a record of, I expect you will report this. It is being reported. And we will move on to the next area. Dungeon Master Gout over here with a middle of the episode break for you guys. Just want to notify you guys that I will be at Phoenix Fan Fusion. So if you want to meet me, I am going to be there. You can find me at booth B902N. I will try to remember to put that in the description in case for some reason... You can't tell what I'm saying. I don't know. It might be nice to see it written. Um, yeah, I'm sharing a booth with MOBD Publishing, so, you know, make sure to check out their stuff as well. Um, I was hoping to have some merch ready for Phoenix Fan Fusion so that I could sell it at the booth, but I don't think that's going to happen, sadly. Oh, well, you know, stuff happens. Maybe next year. Additionally, if you want to support me doing cool stuff like this, check out the Ko-Fi. Consider donating. One of the perks of the $10 Asteroid Dweller tier is that you get access to the 19 playable races of Asteroid Citratus. They aren't 
balanced for use in normal play, so maybe you can balance those a little bit. They're balanced against each other. Um, but yeah, if you want to check those out and maybe play an Asteroid Citratus race in your home game, then go to the Ko-Fi. Back to the show. So next we're going to go over to Highlight Records. You see that there is this nice little record shop with a window with a record player in it. There's a sign and it has a record that's kind of shaped like an eye. Um, you walk into the shop and a little bell rings. You see that on one side of the wall, there are records that it looks kind of like a normal record shop with records on racks against the wall, except on that one side you're looking on, instead of there being album covers, there's descriptions, like historical descriptions, because these are for historical record more. But then on the other wall, it looks like currently they're putting up records that are more musical and have album covers on them currently. And you're here to make a record of the change in the inventory here. Oh, hello, sweetie. Hello. I've been sent to observe the end of one stocking and the beginning of a new one. Oh, well, this is a great one here. Um, we just, uh, lately we've been doing a little bit of research on the records here. We couldn't quite figure out how they worked with the different lumens and all, but uh, we kind of uh, mixed some melancholia and made sure to put the central lumen in the etchings, and now we can make them ourselves. So, uh, yeah. Recently, we got a. We just got one artist right now that, um, you know, Nalia here, who was able to make a few records for us. You know, we're hoping it starts a new trend. Unfortunately, artists are not my expertise. So. Oh well, anybody can be an artist. It just takes a bit of time. You know what? Here's a free one. And she picks one off the shelf and hands it to you. This looks new. Uh, I do not believe that I have seen records of this type before. Well, yeah, this is our... We made them. You made them? Yes. You know what? Um, I can show you the process if you want to see. Hmm. This is not strictly my purpose, but I suppose maybe it is. To see a record being made is the record's beginning. Well, it's a beginning in more ways than one. <sighs> I struggle with these things. Tell me, why are you changing your stock? I do not understand. Was it not good before? We couldn't do this before. This is something we only just figured out. You can't have something to sell if you didn't figure out how to make it to sell it first. Somebody had to be the first to make those historical records over there. Now we're the first to make the current ones. We're, we're not in trouble, are we? I know we're supposed to catalog these things and, you know, make sure it's safe. No, you and... are not in trouble. Okay. I just want to know why. Why do you need to make the new things? Well, it's, it, you know, it's fun. And, like, I've, I mean, I've been researching these for a long time. And, you know, I just think it's so amazing how they made these things. And now I get to do the same thing. And it's kind of like, even though I've never met anyone from back then, it's kind of like I get to step into their shoes for a bit. I'm not really much of an artist myself, but if I can, you know, make the thing that somebody else puts their art on, it's, you know, it's like I contributed to it. I see. Okay, so you want to see? And she come, walks back into the back room, and you see that the back room looks like it's supposed to be a break area. It's more like, you know, there's cupboards for food and there's a table to sit at, but at the side they have this large vat that they're using to, that they're using to mix what looks like melancholia, which is a black tar, and they have jars of cetralumin, and what looks almost like a record player, except it's more of a stainless steel and has like rust on it, it looks old, like it's been repurposed, and there's bits of wood that have been added on to the sides, and a large like arm that goes over um, made of wood that has tubing that carries different um, materials. Well, so what we do here is that we spin the dish, right? And as we're creating it, we just kind of place the melancholia down. And it's important that if we do set your lumen that we know exactly what we're making beforehand. I think I have a bit of a theory that we might be able to override it if we integrate some scud lumen, you know, kind of manipulate it a bit. 
and she begins working on creating a record in front of you and she brings down this wooden arm that is set up and melancholia begins to go out of the tube and onto the dish and begins smoothing it out with like a plastic i don't know what to call it just like a plastic rectangle that kind of smooths it out so we're going to go through here and we just want to get a clean disc of melancholia and then later we're actually going to keep it like this right now because we need to have a separate machine that inscribes it directly by listening to the music but right now what we want to do is we want to put a layer of cetralumin on the bottom so that as they scratch away at the top layer of melancholia it reveals the cetralumin and once the cetralumin is exposed to the air, there's only a few moments before it's unchangeable. One of the great properties of Cetralumen is that it's so static. Once we change it, it can't change anymore. And it's really resistant to degrading. Um, we've actually been, you know, refurbishing some old ones, or we're like um, fixing some old discs that were starting to get a bit too old to work, and with the Cetralumen, and now they're kind of holding what they had there before more. Sorry, I just, I'm kind of rambling a bit. It's kind of my side project. The preservation of these records is a good thing. Oh, well, thanks. You know, uh, uh, other Wicker Hearts have kind of, um, you know, they usually just kind of listen to the record. They have a record of it, um, you know, as a memory. And then if they have the information that's on it, then there's no reason to have the physical thing that it has it anymore. They don't really appreciate it. So thank you. There are others, though, who need to know these things. What about those who do not have memories like ours? I mean, yes, it's a good thing that they record it, but also, it doesn't mean we should stop taking care of what we have here. And as she's talking, she begins um, cleaning up, and she hands you the made record. You know, if you get the chance and you are able to use a device, maybe you could try recording something. I'd love to hear it. Hmm. I typically record with my branches. How does one record on one of these? Well, you're going to need a, one of these devices, and they pull out what looks kind of like a record player, except the needle is has three different points at which it makes contact. And there is what looks sort of like... It's almost like a dream catcher look, where they have two different threads here. There's um, scutalumen threads and there's cetralumen threads, and they interweave almost like a dream catcher. And so you gotta play the music right into here, and that dream catcher portion is almost connected to like a funnel. And it can kind of record the sound, and it needs to ricochet back out. So we have the funnel here, and then what we do is we make those vibrations go into the circuitry here, which we've kind of integrated some hollow static, and then we can have the arm etch in the correct parts here. So I play sounds into the funnel, and it, it's recorded on the disc. Yeah. And, um, you know, that disc that I gave you is pretty small. It takes a long time to make a big one. But uh, I can give you, like, a mini one, or do you want, like, a full... You'd probably be allowed to carry around a full-size one. Uh, you, know, you wicker hearts don't always have homes. You just kind of, like, uh, you can just kind of sleep wherever, right? Yes. So yeah, I can give you like a little one here, and she gives you like a hand-sized one that's almost like the size of a juke, like of a music box, and it vaguely reminds you of what you now know to be called a stain wraith when it dropped what looked like a music box the first time you woke up. I see. Well, uh, back to work. I will keep this. I thank you. Oh yeah, certainly. Um, they're going to head back out to the front of the shop. And as you head back out to the front of the shop, you see that there is a wicker heart standing in the main space and is currently taking out discs and playing them on the record player that is in the shop window. And they didn't ask permission to do this. They're just kind of doing this. She goes, oh, um, do you need something? I'm recording this. Uh, okay. I'll just be careful. They're kind of like leaning down and listening the disc ends and they go put it back and they take out another one and they accidentally break it. I apologize, I've destroyed one of these. And then they go up and grab another one and play it. Oh gosh, well, not much I can do. Well, uh, see ya. Um, what was your name? Evergrey. Evergrey. Well, you can come back anytime. 
I would like to make a recording of the fact that that disc was broken. Okay. Store that away in your mind. Hmm. And you can... You can tell me if you ever do anything of that. <laughs> so we're going to go down to Bobble's Forge. We see an old Alaxian forge that's been refurbished and sits clearly in the wood citadel. There is sort of a box-shaped building that is adjacent to a like metallic building on the side that looks sort of like a bell. You look at the sign and it says Bobble's Forge, and each of the letters kind of looks a little bit like there's a bobble trapped in one of the empty spaces. Walking in, you see Bobble, this small, overweight Cetrazen man with a Burnside mustache and suspenders over a white shirt. Hey, what do you want? I'm here to record. Uh, you always are. You were here last week. You were not here last week. <laughs> I was not here last week. Yes, you were. Do not lie to me. All right, what do you got to see this time? And looking around, you see that, you know those books that are like those search books for little kids that are just filled with r so much random stuff and you're supposed to pick out an image to find? Right? That's what this place looks like. All of the shelves is just covered in baubles and random crud, and you're not sure if he's a hoarder or a master craftsman. All right, what do you got to check out? I know you're always cataloging, like, you're always like, oh, slow down, make less stuff, we can't keep track of it all. Well, I'm sorry if I sell something before you get to see it. I want to see you make something. Oh, you want to see me make something? Well, and he picks up the hammer and starts tw twirling at his fingers, and I'm going to make a sleight of hand check for him. That's a four. Um, the hammer goes flying off at the wall and <laughs> dongs like a bell. And you see that he picks up the hammer again and just, I was meant to do that. What was the purpose in that? Huh? What was the purpose in that? Speak up! What was the purpose in that? Well, I've got to impress you. You got to learn about the acoustic hammer. You can't hear it make a sound if it doesn't hit something. So here's the thing, right? You I know, see. like, people call it diametric melodies, whatever. Look, sound is power. If you can manipulate something with rhythm and music, it's like a formula. You can manipulate its shape. You can manipulate the space around it. I can hammer this all day with a normal hammer. And he kind of gestures to a blade that is over on the anvil in sort of that bell-shaped annex. Well, actually, let me just show you. And he walks over and you guys walk out of this rectangular portion of the building and into this metal forge. And it looks like a large bell that you're standing inside of. And there's an anvil in the center and integrated into the sides of the anvil are, is like a drum on each side with a symbol that looks like fire. He takes a piece of metal, throws it onto the anvil, and hits the side of one of the drums, and you see the metal immediately heats up. All right, so you got to use a specific rhythm. I've written it down over here, and you see his handwriting is just illegible. So if I want to make a dagger, right, it's going to be a 3-4-3 free, free rhythm. And if I keep doing that in between the hits and integrate the sound of it hitting, I can essentially manipulate it with the sound. Um, so, and he holds up this acoustic hammer that is shaped almost like a bell and has hollow portions in it. And as he begins to hammer the piece of metal, each time it hits the metal, he also twists the hammer and has the side of the hammer hit the anvil and it dongs like a bell. And it reverberates the room around it and that those reverberations kind of almost make your head hurt for a moment, but then you acclimate and it stops. Over time, eventually, he crafts it into a pair of daggers. Well, that's what I do here. Now, is there anything else you need to look at, or is this good enough for you? Heh! I am interested in that rhythm. You better be. It's the only thing worthwhile. Tell me. I wish to try and replicate it. I'm going to use... Tinker Toy, my artificer ability, and I'm going to try and replicate that as using the um, the continuous noise feature. Okay. So do you actually hit the hammer against the anvil? Or do you do something else to create the noise and change the technique? 
I'm going to uh, get out. I, I probably have something in my bag. Uh, I'm going to get out one of my. I've, I've got a load of daggers, actually. I'm going to get out my dag, one of my daggers, and I'm going to um, make it try and make the same noises that he made while hitting it with the hammer. Interesting. So you place a piece of metal on the anvil and a dagger next to it, and you manip. You mani How do you manipulate the dagger to make it make sound? Um, I'm going to just sort of put my hand on it. Um, and sort of tap it slightly, and as I tap it, a, a noise rings out of it. And the same rhythm that he was hitting the anvil with begins emanating from the dagger, and he hands you the acoustic hammer. Hmm. Well, I... Well, you know, it's, um... It, you can try it. We can see if it works. Give me... You're hammering something. It's going to be athletics. Okay. Um, also, if you have proficiency in the tool, you can add the proficiency. Uh, I don't. I would get that at the third level. <laughs> uh, that is a zero. Yikes. So on a natural one, as you begin hammering it, you see that there is a resonance happening between the dagger, the two daggers, the one that you're making and the one's happening. And it begins to start a feedback loop where the sound that you're creating is, isn't just affecting the dagger you're making, it's unmaking the dagger next to it. And they sort of meet in the middle, and you end up with a mush on both sides, having destroyed one dagger and half created another. Hmm. Well, that's what happens when- I should record this as well. What? Sorry, speak up. I should record this as well. Yep, record your failure and that I am the best. <laughs> Tell me, what caused this difference? Well, you you know, you changed the technique. I've I've been working on my technique for years. You can't just walk in and act like you know some better way to do it. You've been here for five minutes. This is the only thing that's important. And you do it right. You do it the same way every time. And that will give you the same reliable results. Amazing things. Look in the other room. I see. All right, you got what you need? Yes, but tell me. Yeah? What is it that you believe is important about this? What I do not really comprehend it. Give me a persuasion check. Could you go for all of the skills that I'm really bad at? <laughs> if you think another skill applies, you can try to offer it. Um, not really. Uh, that's a seven. If you want, now that I think about it, you could try to do another athletics check to see if your technique at least impressed him. I'll give you that. That would still be a seven. Okay, yeah, that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, you know, it's it's what I do. It's what I do every day, and, you know, it's everything else just kind of fell away, and look, nothing else is important, okay? Change just makes things worse. And this is the one thing that stays the same. Get out. I see. I will leave you now. Freaking... I thank you for your time. Wooden man or whatever. And we move on to a wedding. You have gone all the way to the Plains of Perception for a wedding of two citizens of the Wood Citadel. They seem to have set up a, like a nice picket fence and they have like potted bushes. It looks like there is mist kind of rolling in from a distance, so they're trying to speed things up a little bit. You see Elenir Panef is up there and they are... They're a stained, so they have purple and yellow blemishes and that's the color of the stained glass and their antlers. They have dark blue robes with a like black shoulder robe over it and a blue banner at the front that shows the Cetraxian symbol, which is a Cetra symbol that is shifted 90 degrees and has an X in it. And they're up there. They're giving the you know speech. I'm not going to go for the speech for a wedding. <laughs> uh, so they're going through that. The two people who are getting married are... The speeches are painful enough. Glad I don't have to hear them in the game. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Edgar Erebonis and Sifril Halen. Edgar Erebonis is a white Cetrazen 
who has obviously the denoting factor of a Cetrazen, which is the Cetra symbol on their eye. And they have a sort of a tux on right now, whereas we have Sifril Halen, who, who is a black Parmidian, who a Parmidian is somebody who has sort of a purplish transparent film across their skin and a Parma symbol on their head. A Parma symbol should show on the screen if you are, unless you're an audio listener, at which point I'm, I'm not going to try to describe that symbol. <laughs> you can look it up. <laughs> Get Patreon. There's images for it on there. Or you can just check it out in the video. And yeah, everybody else is sitting down. They're currently going through it. I will sit down. As you sit down, you see a little kid is like looking around and they have a basket full of flower petals. Like, wait, wasn't I supposed to go? And realizing that they missed their part, walks out into the aisle and starts doing their job of throwing out the petals. As this is happening, you see another wicker heart walk up and they use minor illusion to create an illusion of one of the petals and kind of have it rest on their hand so that they don't have to try to record what the petal is while it's falling through the air. They look at that, they look forward, note who's getting married, and walk away. These other wicker heart, they come and leave. They aren't observing properly. They aren't making complete records. They are only getting what is the bare necessity. Do you do anything else before leaving? I wish to speak to some of the guests. Do you talk during the ceremony? Or do you wait until the reception? Uh, probably wait until the reception. Can I talk to, say, the bride's mother? Something like that. Yeah, you can talk to the bride's mother. It looks like after the main ceremony, they do have to, like, a bunch of people help picking up the stuff and bringing it to another area because some mist is rolling in from the planes of perception, and you really don't want to get caught in that mist. So everybody starts heading off. Um, you're kind of, like, helping carry things, and after a while you make it to the reception... There, everybody kind of sets up, and you do see that the bride's mother is around, yes. I believe I am supposed to congratulate you oh, and um, your daughter. Yes, thank you. Um, I don't recognize you. Are, are you a friend of Edgar's? I was here to record the wedding. Oh, right, yes, that, that makes sense. Um, I thought I already... Wasn't there another wicker heart? I, I saw him show up and record it, um... There was. Tell me, there were many people crying. Why was that? Oh, well, I'm sure um, Daniel probably was just sad he doesn't get a chance anymore. But um, the rest of them, well, it's, you know, it's a milestone in a person's life. It's, you know, for me, I, you know, I may have shed a tear or two. It's, um, you know, I, I don't get to spend as much time with her now. Somebody else is more important to her than me. And I need to accept that, and this just makes it so real. Was it not real before? Well, I mean, yes, but now I'm seeing it. I'm Before there was time, you know? There was, even if there was an hour or ten minutes, it's, there's time left, but now it's, it's done. But it already was. Well, I... I assume, un unless... I am misunderstanding what this process is. It already was. I mean, yeah, it's... I know it's it's superficial, and I'm maybe taking the wrong perspective. It just it feels that way. No, I, I guess you're right. At least, um, in a sense, this is the time I get a little bit more. Get a little bit of time to talk to her here. Thank you. You changed my perspective. I am not sure what I did. But I will take this, thanks. She gives you a hug and walks back over to the party. I don't understand what she was saying. They are the Erebonus family. I think we cut over to the place where you're resting, and you're still asking that question. I have with me a half-melded dagger. A small box used for recording. And all of my memories. I do not understand why I am recording these things. They are not permanent. 
they are changing. The blacksmith bauble said that things that change aren't worth anything. But Miss Halen believed that this change was in some way important. What is this change? What is this difference in perspective? Again, there's that feeling in your mind where if you just tweaked something you recorded, for a moment you could observe change again. Maybe you, it could help answer the question if you just made a tiny little change to a record. No. Um, I'm going to get out the record player that I was given. I want to, rather than changing a record, I want to try and create my own record. Okay, what's on it? It's just a record of my own voice. There isn't really a daylight cycle for Citratus. All of the light is created by things like Cetralumen in this area, for example. So it's hard to say if you spend all night making a record. It's not a large record, so you probably can't store much on it. But you stay awake for a fair while, and not only are you able to record it, but you're able to listen back to it. You're able to hear yourself as a record, separate and distinct from yourself. And we transition over to Golden Heart Hospital. There is sort of a wooden hospital building, not the most sterile, um, that is in the wood citadel. It's not the largest building. It has a fair amount of rooms, though, and there's room, there's cots for people to rest on while they receive medical help, and they each have their own separate room. You walk into a room with, like, a wooden cot in the side of the room. On the window, there is a flower pot, and in it is a chrysalta. A chrysalta is a very thick-petaled plant, almost like desert plant-like, but it has a nice color to it that it makes it still seem like a normal flower. And it looks like as you walk in, it blooms a little and then starts to wilt. Eh, who's there? I am Evergrey. I have been sent here to record. You were already here? I was not. Eh. Well, what do you want? I wish to record this plant. It seems to bloom and then fade in a cycle. I don't know, Edgar put it there. He said it was supposed to help me know I was happy or whatever. Fair lot of good it did there, just kind of sat there in a bulb. Now it's dying. I think he's trying to kill me or something. Why do you want to record the flower? It bloomed when I came in. Just because it's natural and it happens on its own doesn't mean it's worth anything. It just does that. Nobody decided for it to do that. Just because something's natural doesn't mean it's good. I don't ask for much. I just... I just want to... They won't let me go back to my forge. I want to go back there. What did you make? Made a lot of things. I made a gift for them, but I don't know. They they should have they should have come by to pick it up. I shouldn't have to go to their house. And you see that kind of in his hand, he's clutching a bit of grass that has it doesn't look super distinctive, but to you you would notice. That looks like it's from the planes of perception. And it is inset in a stained glass, and normally when you see stained glass, it's in segments, right? You, like The leaves are always a single color, and the trees will have separate colored leaves. Or the glass windows are usually layered leaves, and it's you can see the separation of colors, but with this, it has more of a blur between them. 
Well, I just, you know, I figured they'd want to remember something. And, you know, you're always recording things. Maybe they'd want that. And, you know, it's something I made and whatever. I'm not good with glass. Metal's better. Tell me, what is important about this to you? It's not important. Just thought I should make it. Why? Tell me why you thought you should make it. Persuasion check. That's an eight. No. Another one to the tally. Um, I'll let you succeed if you take a stress. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, make sure you guys take keep track of your stresses. I should actually do that too. What stress? We we're carefree over here. Everything's fine. Stress is gonna be even worse with us, considering we never roll well. The one time we do roll well, he's gonna make us re-roll it. No, <laughs> only the important time you roll well. <laughs> Well, just, I, I love what I do, and, you know, and they love each other, and I wanted them to love what I do. I don't know. Couldn't go there. I don't belong there. They haven't seen me in a long time. I just, you know, when I'm gone, I, I still want to be here. I don't know if anybody I sell my stuff to actually takes care of it, but if, you know, if they care, maybe they would have taken care of it. And I could have lived longer. I see. But you are alive. Don't know why they won't let me go back to my forge. Keep telling them I'm fine. He kind of looks a bit weaker when he's saying that. Get me back to my forge. I want to. I want to make more stuff. I would need the doctor's permission. Freaking help me up! You don't need the doctor's permission. They're just gonna say no. You're just. Gonna... And his head just rolls to the side. What are you doing? What are you doing, man? And the chrysalta on the windowsill fully wilts. Somebody knocks next to the door. The door is open. I'm sorry. Uh, am I interrupting something? I just uh, came to see my father. Is he, is, are you doing this man well? Has, this man has stopped moving. Oh. And as we see him become breathless and rush to his side, we zoom out. We are going to end the session there. And next session, we will pick up at Roderick Talon's Manor, where all of you will be together and we'll be out of the backstory scenes and into the campaign <laughs> proper. It didn't take two weeks, I promise. <laughs> I, I'll learn to do this better in the future. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's How did fun. this take so long? Things just keep this happening. Was great. <laughs> this was great. Um, everyone keeps rolling badly because second rolled a nat 20 to exist and now everything's gone downhill. Oh, <laughs> yeah. It's... <laughs> oh, These man. rolls would be terrible. <laughs> I know. Oh, I, my I, God. Uh, I feel like we need a new dice bot. Yeah, I've been setting the DCs at ten. Like, <laughs> just loving everything. Most of the fifteen has been very rare. Most of the DCs have been ten, and I thought that was generous. Maybe I should be setting some at five. You guys are level one. <laughs> yeah, it, I, maybe. Uh, I don't know. But we have also been rolling unusually low. <laughs> I almost lost my med kit. Okay. <laughs> My oh. whole character backstory was almost shattered. <laughs> what what I do really like is that Evergrey rolled terribly on anything to do with maps. <laughs> that, that's, that's amazing. I'm so happy with that. <laughs> Didn't he roll terribly on everything? <laughs> he rolled terribly no. on persuasion and things to do with maps, which 
I mean, that's not that's not bad. <laughs> Makes sense. Yeah, I like the insinuation that the dice knows what we're trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice when the dice tells a story, and you guys are level one. Not everything's yeah. gonna go your way yet. Yeah. Failure is always fun. Yeah. Loved uh, Twigs. What are you doing? <laughs> Dying. <laughs> I really like Evergrey so far. I like all y'all's characters. Okay, well, that concludes this episode of Astrid Citratus Journey to Alaxia. See you next time. <laughs>